I'm Kelly Leonard. And I'm Michael Paul Williams. And welcome to the After the Monuments podcast, where we look at events and news about race in a historical context and see how, too often, history repeats itself. After the Monuments, a real talk about race with Michael Paul Williams and Kelly Lemon. And we are excited to have Dr. Danny Avula with us live and in person. I can see you. I can actually touch you, but I'm not going to right now. Um, So, Danny, welcome to the podcast. Um, We're excited to have you on because you have been with us through this whole thing Um. In different roles. So can you tell us what you do um, right here in Richmond? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the last uh, 10 plus years, I've been the local public health officer here in Richmond, a local public health doc, helping this community navigate uh, health issues. And obviously, we've been living through a a pretty big one in COVID. And so uh, I spent the year of 2020 uh, helping Richmond and Henrico uh, figure out how to make sense of COVID and uh, providing as much information and direction as possible. Uh, and then in 2021, I was asked by Governor Northam to run point on the state vaccination effort. So got pulled into the state and and really, you know, for a public health doc, I don't know that there's anything I'll ever do that's more uh, impactful than spending that year helping Virginia get vaccinated. Um, and then I've moved into a new role in about a month ago. I just started as the new commissioner of the State Department of Social Services. So still really invested in uh, health and well-being and in low-income families getting stable, uh, but just from a different angle than I've spent most of my career. Yeah. Michael Paul and I have been talking um, already, just, you know, kind of getting ready for to for you to join us. And, you know, the thing about this podcast is we're looking at what things happened back then Mm -hmm. and how they're still happening today, how these communities of color are still being affected by um, different ways of of the pandemic, of uh, race war, of, uh, you know, policy systems, all these things. Can you, can you, can you talk a little bit or Michael Paul, if you want to jump in, um, in regards to the past and, 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 and the present? Sure. Uh, you know, I'll start with the fact that so much of the public health lens is looking at root causes, you know? And so when we're looking at the health outcomes of different communities, uh, we look at data and the data clearly tells us that some communities have uh, lower rates of chronic disease than others. Some communities have lower life expectancies than others. And so we as public health practitioners need to figure out, okay, what is driving that and peel the layers back? And what of that is related to Current behavior? Is it access to healthcare? Um, but we often find that it's much deeper than that, yeah. right? It is uh, the historical policies and practices that have created the circumstances and environment that drive uh, that drive health outcomes, and not just health outcomes, but social outcomes, educational outcomes, go on and on and on. And so that has been, uh, you know, my calling over, over the career of, of figuring out what are those root causes and how do we do address? Them. Yeah. So. <clears throat> There are all these varying levels of vulnerability and exposure and, and, and access to mitigation that have been, we've been dealing with throughout the pandemic. And, and, and you've been at the front line. And for many of us, we look at you and we see a lifeline. Um, but to our topic, some people look at you and they see the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, how did public health become so politicized. Oh, I mean, you, we, we all want to be healthy, right? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. So how, how did that happen? Well, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll speak specifically through the lens of vaccination, but we can open it up to, you know, I think there has been, prior to COVID, this kind of fringe and growing group of people who uh, wanted to reject the data, reject the science around vaccination. Um, and and really present a, a different path forward. And, and that was a pretty small group of people pre-COVID. I feel like what we have lived through as a country over the last two years, uh, really you know, starting with the onset of this disease and uh, national leadership that, mm-hmm. that wanted to downplay it. Right? Mm-hmm. You remember President Trump said, this will be gone by Easter, right? This will be gone by yeah. April when, when yeah. we were first seeing it come for, for the the church is being yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It'll be a miracle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you start with the downplaying of the reality of this disease, and you follow that up with sort of the continued um, disenfranchisement of science, the continued, uh, you know, 
setting science aside, scientists are flip-flopping. We don't know what we're talking about. Uh, and, and then, so, so that starts to sow the seeds of distrust in an institution in, of science and an institution of the CDC that a lot of people have trusted for a very long time. Uh, but then you just see over the course of 2020, the politics and the identity, like people really cling yeah. to, I'm going to wear a mask or I'm not. I'm going to yeah. believe in COVID or I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay home or I'm not. That that was so part of people's identity attached to their politics that really was playing out at the national level. And you use a point, and I've got to digress here slightly, sowing the seeds of distrust. Mm. We live in a time when people are sowing the seeds of distrust in virtually all of our institutions. Yeah. Um, the media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Congress and, 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 and just the political structure itself. Uh, it. You know, I don't know how we get out of that, but, yeah. you know, if you're in this environment of distrust, it's hard to unify to do anything. But I'm of an age, being the old man of the panel, <laughs> here, <laughs> who came of age in the, in the afterglow of the polio vaccine. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you know the history of what polio sure. was. And, and... <clears throat> You know, it put us in an environment where we were not only taking vaccines for polio, but all sorts of childhood diseases. You know, getting a shot was a way of life. That mm-hmm. I mean, I don't recall anyone in my childhood really thinking twice about. Yeah. It's just, and still, it's very much part of our culture. Uh, if you want to send your child to school. So how did this particular vaccine uh, become... Such a political flashpoint. Yeah. I mean, for the better part of a century, you know, vaccination immunization has been one of the key advancements of public health. It has saved lives. It, it's extended life expectancy. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there has always been a small group of folks who just wanted to ask more questions, didn't really trust uh, the science, you know, had their own issues around vaccination. But as I said before, that's a pretty small group of people. Uh, and and that, a huge sample size. Yeah, <laughs> that's I mean, right. I mean, that's how right. many people have taken these shots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's exactly right. So Over that, how many decades? I know. So that exploded with with the with COVID, and I and I think, you know, there's parts of it that I don't really understand, but I do think it comes back to um, how did the president at the time uh, convey his belief or lack thereof in what was happening with COVID and subsequently with vaccination? And this is a weird you know, pivot point, because it was his administration that made vaccination possible, right? We had done something that we've never done historically in creating an incredibly effective vaccine in a year or less time. And so that was something that the administration could have really grabbed onto, could have said, hey, we've done something we've never done before. Um, and and it, he, you know, I remember he got vaccinated in, in private, right? Yeah. He was not very outspoken of, about that. Um, and I remember he, it seemed like he came around sort of after after the change of administration, but he was at a rally down in Alabama and he said, you know, I think you all should get vaccinated. He got booed, by, you know, and so I think so much of his language and action uh, was kind of speaking to the, the larger cultural movement and trying mm-hmm. to play to that. And so then the question is, what drove the larger cultural movement? I mean, he clearly played a part in that. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the conservative media certainly played a part. You think about folks and, and uh, characters like Tucker Carlson, who, who, who continuously raised questions and said, is this real and presented the other side. Um, so it is it's a strange time. And the the again, that politicization has just been felt on a scale that I don't remember anything else. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to call it what it is. Um, yeah. um, uh, it's irresponsibility, mm. political irresponsibility on a lethal level. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, and, and countless people have died. Uh, I, I think some of these elected officials are going to have a lot to answer mm-hmm. history for. Um, I, I'm watching Ron DeSantis on video uh, speaking at a college with um, some college students standing behind him, masked. And he starts barking at them uh, about, you know, we've got to stop this COVID theater. Mm -hmm. Like COVID theater. Mm. Like all of this is fiction. Yeah. Yeah. And he shames college students into taking off their masks. I mean, what? 
how in the world, what is that about? I mean, I thought this was about individual freedom and liberty. Okay, we're not, we, we're not going to mandate this, but people should be free to do whatever they want. No! You know, he's hectoring people who are wearing masks. Mm-hmm. And it seems like this is a societal thing where you're on team mask. Or not on team mask, mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. or team vaccine, or not a one. And, and 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 people make judgments. And how you walk in the room that. if you have a mask on or don't have a mask on. I mean, you really do get, like you said, you get judged. Yeah, and I I had to think a lot about that as as you know Richmond's public health doc to just when I'm out and about, how is that going to be perceived? And and I remember there was time really in in recent weeks where I felt like I had a responsibility to help people. Uh, normalize where we're at now. It's a totally different context than we were a year ago and and almost kind of give a stamp of approval to, hey, it's okay for us to move. And especially, you know, last two weeks ago, the CDC changed their guidance and that kind of freed everybody up. But uh, yeah, it, it is, you know, I think it is such a sign of what tribe are you mm-hmm. with? What team are you on? And that's really problematic. But the point with people like Governor DeSantis is you don't know um, what that person is yeah. up against. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The people you're hectoring yeah. behind you could have comorbidities. Yes, absolutely. That make them especially vulnerable to the virus. He doesn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't know their medical history. So, I mean, why, <laughs> you know, we've got to stop making the assumptions. Yeah, about, I think that's absolutely in, right. in, in the stump speech. Um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Fauci, um, have you ever heard anyone say, hang? Fill in the blank, public oh, health leader. Gosh. That's crazy. People yeah. want to hang him. They yeah. want to criminalize his behavior and send him to prison. Yeah. Have you ever, they think they, they, he's received threats. Yeah. And as have other public health officials. Have you? I, I, I was did. about to say, have yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. You know, I, the, they're. I got a lot of affirmation during that period. Certainly lots of people thanking me and the team for, for our efforts. But uh, I got a lot of angry emails as mm-hmm. well. And a lot of folks who asked me to resign, a lot of folks who said, uh, hey, don't, don't continue to uh, you know, share this vaccine propaganda. Um, and then a few that were much more pointed and, uh, you know, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ram your head through a, you know, mm. like pretty, pretty mm. awful stuff. It's insane. Mm. Yeah, mm. it was, it was a, yeah. And, you know, I've never seen anything like it in, in the public health field. I think this is a sort of uniquely critical time of public health. And I'll come back to the fact that I, I think that our former president did that, you know, yeah. being on the national stage, casting doubt about uh, what Dr. Fauci, what Dr. Burks were saying, and really trying to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to, to not validate these institutions and, and this approach that we've taken for all of our modern history in looking scientifically at uh, what did the study show, what does the data show, and how do we make recommendations and policy based on like that is it's something that was sort of chucked aside this last administration. And again, I must digress. Elected officials, election mm-hmm. officials, mm-hmm. same thing. Threats. Yeah. Threats of violence. Discredited. I mean, it's just, just again, our institutions and people who were um, at some point viewed as um, impartial and beyond reproach mm-hmm. and professional or seem to be under assault yeah. here. Real quick, After the Monuments is proud to thank Team Henry Enterprises for their support of our show. Team Henry Enterprises is a black-owned contracting firm specializing in office, retail, medical, multifamily, and higher education construction of all scopes and sizes. In the wake of the George Floyd protest, Team Henry is the very firm contracted by the city of Richmond to take down the Confederate monuments in Richmond and by many other municipalities to remove other Confederate monuments around Virginia and throughout the Southeast. Learn more about Team Henry and how they can help your community rebuild, renovate, or design at TeamHenryENT.com. Let me throw something in, in, in here. Um, we not only were going through a pandemic, but then as we're all at home, we watched the murder of George Floyd, which then brought in another health concern because our mental now is starting to be triggered by the things that we're watching and we're seeing as these riots are playing out. Um, and so the mental health of Americans, along with a pandemic, yeah. can we can we can we get into to, to that at a public health standpoint? Sure. Because, again, people of color do not deal with the fact that suicide rates are up. 
depression is at a, I mean, an all time high. Teenagers right now, uh, they, you know, they, they, they turn to their phones for, you know, for any, any medical advice or any therapy that they need. How yeah. is that, a, which, you know, which bring on mental health issues of their own. Yeah. <laughs> sure yeah. Self-esteem. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, I felt this pretty up close and personal. I am a pediatrician by training. I still work a little bit as a pediatric hospitalist, um, which, is, which means that I manage kids when they're admitted to the hospital. Uh, and I was working a shift back in November uh, of, uh, of 2020. So uh, this was, you know, COVID was well underway. Mm-hmm. School had been completely virtual for most folks. Um, and one of the things we do is, is, you know, managing the kids on the floor. I had two kids on the floor who had attempted suicide and were there recovering from that, which is abnormal by itself. That typically doesn't happen. But, uh, that same night in the emergency room, we had six more adolescents who had all attempted suicide, who were waiting for bed placement. And the reason they were waiting was because every adolescent psych facility in the region and beyond were full. I mean, the, the, the mental health system. Uh, experienced an incredible crisis and, and will continue to mm-hmm. because the mental health stuff isn't going to go away mm-hmm. now that COVID is getting better, right? Mm-hmm. There's going to be a period of unwinding uh, of, of recovery that lasts years from this. Mm-hmm. And, and we're going to have to figure out how do we um, change the conversation, make it more normal to uh, pursue things like <clears throat> therapy, acknowledge people's depression, anxiety, uh, and then give them the support and the resources to help on a path to healing. Yeah. And, and where is that support? I mean, is it at the public health level? Is there enough staff in order to do that? I mean, I even reported um, about the the nurse examiners Mm -hmm. that, you know, Fairfax and Richmond are the only hospitals, only two hospitals in the state of Virginia that have the the sexual abuse Mm -hmm. examiner, you know, so short staffed on that, like in yeah, there's been a you know longstanding lack of investment in mental health. I think that there's some things that came out of COVID that will help, right? So uh, reimbursement for telemedicine is one of those things. And telemedicine isn't the, the answer to everything, but I do think it actually will increase access to talk therapy, to connection um, with, with professionals. And so as long as we can keep some of that going, that could be one part of the, the path forward. Um, but Clearly, our mental health system yeah. needs needs money, needs investment, needs bolstering, and that's staff. But it's also the connectedness of all of these different uh, points of service. You know, public health needs to be screening for mental health. Schools need to be screening for mental health, and then getting getting folks the help that they need. Mm-hmm. Why is a country with the relative wealth of the United States in this sort of bind as far as a public health investment and in 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 the way that it manifests itself in our a relative failure is in addressing the pandemic. Yeah, Michael Paul, this is a question public health has been asking for decades. And, and you know, when you look at uh, outcomes like infant mortality, uh, for, for a clear example, or maternal mortality, we rank among uh, the lowest in developed countries around the world. And, it, and it's because our per capita expenditures on public health pale in comparison. I was hearing that on the radio to today. Other countries. Black women are three times more likely to die yeah. in childbirth. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and so I think, you know, there are things about that when we start to look at racial disparities that are unique to the history of this country, right? Like the ills of slavery, yeah. of Jim Crow, and of everything that has persisted into this time creates circumstances, creates stress, creates uh, increased levels of cortisol mm. uh, that, that lead to poorer health outcomes. Mm. And so, you know, there are these underlying issues and, and contexts that we've got to uh, acknowledge invest in and fix moving forward if we're going to eliminate things like race disparities. Are we talking enough about this? Mm-hmm. I mean, there are people who want to assign all, all of the ugly history to the past, mm-hmm. but it still lives with us yeah. and it's still killing us. Yeah. I mean, how, I mean, I don't hear those conversations on a widespread level. When people talk about reparations, immediately people think about cash and dollar mm-hmm. signs. And what about, um, Free health care. Yeah, it's healthcare. sure. Healthcare. You know, yeah. how that could manifest itself in, 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 in remedial health care, in, 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 in mitigating things um, and addressing um, these maladies that we know have a disproportionate effect on, on communities of color, black community. What, yeah. Where are those conversations? Yeah. I, I want to answer a question you answered, asked before about the why. Like, why are we not having more of these conversations or why do these things still persist? And I think, you know, part of America's story is, uh, that of 
opportunity for some folks and not others. But uh, the ethos of this country is we we came and we had the whole land available to us mm. and we had opportunity to uh, you know pursue whatever path we wanted and then based on our efforts and hard work we could be successful or not. And what we have seen is that that is true for some people and not of others. It's largely not true for many of our historically oppressed minority residents. And so, but that ethos of, of individual determinism, opportunity, sort of, you know, pull up your bootstraps and, and, and make your way uh, flies in the face of some of these other concepts. Like how do we care for a community? Well, how do we, uh, you know, take individual behaviors that that impact uh, other parts of our community, like wearing a mask or like getting vaccinated. And so the mentality that focuses on the individual and not on the corporate uh, is is so much a part of, of who America is. Um, and that and so when we, we ask the question why it's that well, let's let's talk about racist actions, right? Like uh, as an individual, people feel like I'm nice to black people, right? Like I'm 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 not calling people the N-word. And so they feel like individually they're absolved. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it really requires a, a step back, mm -hmm. a look at the corporate, a look at the systemic yeah. to say, okay, but look at our history and look at what is still uh, unwound, like what, what, what is still persisting mm -hmm. uh, in, in outcomes that we're, we need to be concerned about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if we look at, as far as I'm concerned, any disease requires a collective, a pandemic, requires a collective response. You can't defeat the pandemic on an individual level. It, it requires a collective response. Um, just like racism requires yeah. a collective response. It's a congenital disease <laughs> of the American nation. Yeah. You, you, you can't solve it individually. Um, you know, I don't know how we, we get people to think that way, but that, I think it's essential. I mean, individualism can't conquer everything. Yeah. And we right. see that in, in some of the responses we're talking about. Um, and when I see, when I hear high profile people saying this is an individual choice, mm. this is a personal choice. No. Um, if you're an athlete, yeah. you not only does your choice potentially affect the health of, of fans and teammates and, and, and coaches, it affects whether they win or lose. Yeah. It's it literally, you're literally on a team. Yeah. So then America's a team. And I don't. We, Are we? Doesn't always feel like <laughs> that. We're, 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 we should be. Yeah, yeah, teams yeah. can be dysfunctional. You're right. You're right. You're you're right. Know, you're right. Team, a team can take 10 different cabs to the game, but yeah. we're, you know, yeah. we're supposed to be Team America. Yeah. And our quarterback did, did back then was not throwing the ball, you know, like at all, at all. Yeah. Um, bringing it a little bit local, you, you, you talked about your. Um, your your job with Richmond mm -hmm. and Henrico. Uh, for those that are listening to this outside of Virginia, very they are right beside each other, but totally different. Yeah. Can you talk about the differences when in public health in the counties, then more so state at large? Sure. Um, because when you look at Northern Virginia versus Tidewater versus our rural areas, our very rural areas um, in, in Virginia, and then how we may have uh, fared n nationally. Yeah, we can sure. Um, and I'll, I'll start with kind of the, the school experience mm -hmm. as one example. Uh, you know, remember uh, schools went virtual March of 2020 and then uh, for, stayed that way for the rest of the school year. Um, and then a lot of the debate started about whether should we should be back in school in person. How do we make that happen? Uh, that didn't happen for much of the first semester of 2020, really, until vaccination became available. But um, I very clearly remember, uh, you know, presenting to the school boards, talking about, hey, yes, COVID is a concern and uh, we want to keep kids safe. We do know that COVID is a much milder illness in kids. Um, and especially once vaccinations started to become available, uh, that started to change the calculus. and. The folks in Richmond who are majority minority, uh, you know, that their willingness to get to get into that conversation was very different than the folks in Henrico. And you'd hear it both from the staff, the teachers, but also from the parents who were sort of on different sides of this parents saying my, uh, virtual education has been terrible for my kid. I need my kid back in school. 
Um, and, and teachers saying, but I don't, but you know, I'm, I'm putting myself at risk. I, yeah. I get paid peanuts. Mm. <laughs> uh, but, but that conversation played out very differently differently in Richmond and Henrico. And I think so much of that is because of the real experience of people, you know, Richmond school system in particular, as being a majority African-American school system, you know, those families and teachers experienced COVID in a very different way, Mm -hmm. especially early on. They had people in their own families, in their neighborhoods, in their congregations who were hospitalized or who died of this disease. And I think a lot of folks uh, you know, white or more affluent just didn't have the same experience, didn't have that personal connection to the devastation that COVID brought. Mm. Uh, and and so it was, it made it easier to say, it's not that big a deal. We need, we need to get our, our kids back. Now, you know, I, I should also say that I argued on both sides, I mean, <clears throat> on both Richmond and Henrico to say that being in virtual school is having huge, uh, huge impacts on our kids. Certainly academically, learning is down. We've, we've seen that bear out in the data, but also in terms of mental health and the, and the burden on parents and so many other aspects. And so I said, there are safe ways for us to get back to school in person. And then I took the arrows, right? Like, I, you know, from, from both sides saying, you're not, you're not speaking strongly enough or uh, you're, not, you're not caring well for our kids. And so I think that's one example of where the uh, sort of racial and income divide between the city and the county, mm. and really even within the county, because Henrico County, as you know, yeah. uh, the eastern side is is more lower income African American, the western side is more upper income and, and white, um, and so we saw that split coming from the county itself. But 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 that was one example of where I saw a difference between Richmond and Henrico. Uh, vaccination uptake was another big part of that. You know, you saw a um, you know, a more skeptical population, younger African Americans being that primary demographic who were resistant to vaccine, really based on the history of uh, public health uh, measures that that have not landed well with the black community. Um, and so, Henrico, as a more suburban, more educated, more affluent, we saw significantly higher rates of vaccination. Mm-hmm. Um, similar patterns at the state level. You know, when you look at education and uh, and income, uh, those are the areas that had the highest rates of vac- vaccination. Northern Virginia, the Charlottesville region, Richmond, greater greater Richmond metro, eastern Tidewater. Um, where we saw the lowest rates of vaccination actually were in that southwest uh, Virginia. And that that jives with what a lot of the nation saw, which is that uh, more conservative, low education communities uh, we're, we're much more skeptical of the vaccine. And, and that certainly bore out in Virginia and, and the Southern states mm-hmm. across the board. Mm. So takeaways, yeah. yeah. just moving forward. Um, what could public health from the CDC down to the local level have done differently and, and perhaps more effectively um, uh, at the onset yeah. or even prior to the onset? Well, I, I think the CDC in particular, you know, consistency of messaging was a mess, right? You'll remember a time at the very beginning of this where uh, we didn't really have a great sense of how the disease was transmitted. We were concerned about how much of it is respiratory, how much of it is contact, um, how much of it gets transmitted through asymptomatic spread. We didn't, we didn't know. Uh, and so the CDC kind of making statements and making policy determination in that, I mean, they, they had to say something, um, but... Uh, I, the mask guidance in particular, initially they were like, you know what, let's not wear masks. We need, and, and the intent was we need to preserve this for healthcare providers. But uh, the message came out as this is not an important pathway to, to stopping the spread of disease. Mm-hmm. A month later, mm-hmm. you got the opposite message, right? It was actually masks are one of the most important things we can do to stop the spread of disease. And so that just left people confused yeah. and saying, what do I believe here? And you have that in the backdrop of a president saying scientists don't know what they're talking about. So what do we learn? I mean, I think that consistency of messaging is important. Transparency about what we know and what we don't know is important. Uh, But I also think we're like moving forward are going to have to find ways to um, reestablish trust that Mm -hmm. has clearly been lost in scientific institutions. And, And I don't know how to do that without science and policy and government all saying, hey, this is how we make our decisions. And this is, uh, you know, this is what we're going to be rooted in moving forward. And that's going to take time. How prepared are we for the next one? What did, 
you know, we you said what we learned and, and you kind of gave us an example, but when the when and if the next one comes, yeah. how how prepared is public health? I think the answer is yet to be determined because okay. what I mean, we've learned a lot of what works. I'll give you the Richmond experience of uh, you know, recognizing that we are going to receive uh, skepticism from non-English speaking communities or undocumented communities or African-American com communities. And to overcome that, we need a workforce that reflects those communities. We need uh, not only bilingual people who speak the language, but who understand the culture yeah. and who understand how it is that undocumented people receive messages from the government. So our workforce needs to look different and we need to make investments in that. Mm. If we're not given the funding to be able to build that kind of workforce moving forward, we're going to be in the same position we were when, when all of this started. So I think a lot of the how ready are we for the next one depends on what happens in the next couple of years in terms of establishing in, in, uh, funding streams to build the public health workforce. I think there's another gap, which is um, that health and, and government and politics are all, as we've seen over the last two years, inextricably bound. And there just aren't enough experts out there who are looking at how do we disentangle that? How do we think about health behavior in a context of politics? Um, and how do we change our communications and, and, our, and our approaches based on this new context we find ourselves in? That, that's got to be a big learning moving forward. I mean, connected to, to politics, to education. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen how we'd rely so much on the school. I mean, daycare services. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. right. Um, the economy doesn't work. I mean, it's just, there, there's just so much interconnection. I don't know how we function without a healthy society yeah. or a society that that um, respects science um, because we've seen what happens if we don't respect science. <laughs> science, science has the last word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, it's it's on one hand, uh, it's hard to be hopeful given what we've lived through these last two years, uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know. We are resilient people, yeah. right? And we will, like, I think we've got to have these voices. We've got to have the next Dr. Fauci, and not just at the national level, but we've got to have these voices mm -hmm. in and around every community. And we've got to have uh, government and politicians who get behind them to restore that trust. Yeah. I mean, don't we, I'm always <laughs> thinking we need to just be reevaluating <laughs> our approach to healthcare in America. Yeah, no doubt. There's just something horrendously piecemeal about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and unequal and, um, you know, inefficient in a time of crisis that we, I don't know, lessons learned. I mean, yeah. is it possible for us to learn lessons? I mean, I, I think part, I, I certainly agree with that. I mean, I think part of the solution is rethinking and redesigning the health system, the way that people access care. But let's also remember that health outcomes are only partially determined by whether you have access to a doctor or not, mm. right? So many of these issues have to do with things like stable housing, mm. stable families, stable incomes, what we in public health call the social determinants of health. But our, uh, uh, our ability to address health disparities goes far beyond fixing the healthcare system. That's important. We need mm -hmm. to do it. But it, what it really means leaning into these deeper drivers of health and opportunity. What country's doing it right? What country out there is literally you're saying, there's the model. Yeah. We should just copy it. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the European countries have, have really looked as, as health as a, as a right. As a, I mean, you, do you want to ratchet up the, <laughs> the abuse <laughs> that you were seeing? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know. I know. But, but, but the, the reality is that there is at least a, a, a baseline safety net that everybody can access. And mm -hmm. that makes a difference in terms of health outcomes. Now, people will say... Uh, the U.S. at 350 million people is a different beast. We have way more diversity. We have way more income inequality. Uh, and those things are true, but those shouldn't be excuses, right? Like we should still figure out how do we redesign the system. So European countries are much smaller. They have a totally different ethos about them in terms of, uh, you know, the greater good, the common good. Um, but I, I think we, we need to take notes and, and start designing our system in, in, in ways that, that mirror that. I think another way that we took a big misstep as a country was attaching access to healthcare to employment, 
right? Mm-hmm. The fact that empl- like yeah. insurance is attached to whether you have a job or not uh, is is problematic because when you are like employers will find ways around that, right? Like I'll only hire you as a contract employer. I'll only hire you at 20 hours a week. So I don't have to provide benefits. Um, how is that serving us collectively? After the monuments. Yeah. I mean, it makes too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> It'll never work. It'll never work. <laughs> Dr. Avula, thank you for joining us, taking the time. Um, any last words that you want this audience to hear as we are going to be, you know, nationally syndicated? Um, is there anything that you want them to hear about the Virginia public health system? Yeah, I think... Uh, Public health here in Virginia, but really everywhere, uh, needs needs more investment. Certainly, like we've got to we've got to learn from these last couple of years. We've got to understand how we actually are in and of communities, how we connect to people, how we think about behavior change in this new context where politics and health are so connected. Um, and then I, I will say to our government and elected officials, we need to back science. We need to get back. Uh, in the in the understanding that we are a data driven institution, we have an incredible ability to collect information and to translate it, and and we just need to restore the public trust in that. Thank you so much for joining us Thank on you. After the here. Monuments. This was a great conversation. After the Monuments is a Virginia Video Network production and produced by Matt Pachilli, Michael Paul Williams, and me, Kelly Lemon. Technical direction and editing from Bill Barksdale. Executive production from Paul Farrell, Diane Salvatore, and Paige Mudd. Will Royer provides studio support. Our artwork is by Krishna Mathis. I'm Kelly Lemon, and we'll see you next week on After the Monuments. <laughs>